Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel and I am so, so excited to be bringing you today's video. I am very, very grateful, first of all, to Goliath, the creator of the El Goliath Tarot deck, for sending me this deck to share with you guys. He is giving me the opportunity to do a bit of a first look here before the deck ships out to everybody and I just am really, really over the moon. The El Goliath Tarot deck is one that I have been looking at for a long, long time. I would kind of talked myself out of the deck to be completely honest because I had a few quibbles with the first edition, but I have to say there are not a whole lot of independent decks out there where the second edition takes so much of the tarot community's feedback into account and I, I'm really, really impressed with Goliath and the changes he made to the second edition in answer to the feedback and the um, reviews that he got on the first edition. I'm going to be diving into this and sharing it with you guys live, my first impressions. I'm really, really excited, but I just wanted to start out with that thank you because I am over the moon about this. And this was not, um, this is not a inexpensive deck to produce or to ship. And so lots and lots of gratitude to Goliath. I really appreciate it. As always, you guys know that I will always share with you my honest feedback and my honest thoughts on any deck, whether I purchased it with my own money or, as in this case, it was sent to me for review. But I do like to be transparent about that for you. So with that being said, I'm really excited to dive into this. I... Oh! I'm bumping my camera, that's how excited I am because I'm talking with my hands. Alright, so it arrived like this, which I think is so sweet. So it was all wrapped up in tissue paper like a literal present. I, I, I love this kind of thing. And I don't know if you've ever watched one of my like Witch's Moon or Witch's Bounty unboxings or Witch's Roots unboxings, you know my favorite part is like untying the parchment. Oh no, except I say that and then I'm not going to be able to untie it because I am challenged with like knots and things. Oh, 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 haha, yes satisfying. I didn't want to have to cut it because that's just not as much fun for some reason. Oh, 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 oh. I got it mostly done. Now I'm going to have to cut. Okay, I'm going to take this off camera so you guys don't have to see me handle a knife because that is scary. <laughs> Makes my family cringe every time I do it. All right. So we got the bow untied, but I didn't need to cut it there. I'm okay with that. Look at this sticker on here, the El Goliath Tarot Deck. I don't know if it's going to focus. There we go. It's got that kind of marble look to it. Love that. It's like, I love being able to unwrap things. This makes me so giddy happy. All right. So I know this is an awkward angle, but I'm just going to, are you guys rippers? When you open presents, do you rip or do you, do you like neatly unwrap? I am a ripper. I am a, I'm a ripper. <laughs> the things I say on my channel, I really need to be more careful. First of all, holy moly, can we talk about how sleek and like nice this box is? Okay. I've got to get the plastic off of it. So let me get off camera with my knife again. So I don't alarm anybody for my personal safety. <laughs> And let's get into it. Oh my gosh, you guys. I have been eyeballing this artwork for so long. Look, more ripping. I just, there's no class. I want to know. Do you do this in a classy way or are you a ripper? I want to know. Since I called myself a ripper, somebody else is going to have to own up to it. All right. I'm not sure how the box opens yet. Is it a lift off? It looks like it's a lift off. Is there something holding it closed? Okay, so before I lift it off, let's take a look. So it is going to be a two-piece box and it lifts off. So it says, an alchemical shamanic tarot manifesto featuring 95 cards suited for spiritual divination, mystical exploration, readings and guidance, including a guidebook. I love that the back has all of this stunning artwork on it. Um, there go my doggos. Second edition, the cover is the same. Really nice. There go I'm sorry for my dogs. <laughs> they're getting excited. I think it's almost their dinner time, so they're getting a little bit worked up. So lift off box. Beauty. Ooh. Written and illustrated by Goliath. That's the inside of the lid. You can see a reflection on my camera there, but that is it. I'm really excited. Okay, so first of all, we have a ribbon to lift out the book. It looks like we're gonna have more plastic to deal with here, but this is really nice. So I will say it looks like, and I didn't, I've never held the first edition. Um, I know that one of the things that threw people initially was that the, the book opens in this way um, and that the font was pretty small. The font seems small, but it doesn't seem at all unreadable to me. So I don't know if that, if it's been, in, if the font size has been increased. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if the font size in here has been increased but you get full pictures of the cards and there's a lot of information. We will look at one of them together near the end here, but 
just to give you an idea of how the book is laid out. That's really nice. Let's set that to the side here. By the way, I love this image with the lion and the snake and the cobra there. Okay, so now we have, that was the ribbon that lifted out the book. So now we have this like really nice like velvet case holding the cards and they're divided into two piles. Oh, you guys are etched in black. I don't think I knew that, okay. And then each of these little piles also has a spot where you can lift out your stacks of cards and the backings have also changed. So let me get these piles opened and set this part of the box aside for now so that we have space. Again, I'm gonna use my knife off camera. Oh my gosh, I'm really excited and I actually really like the new backing. The old backing, I believe, was kind of like a lemnus kit or an infinity symbol. Um, and I don't think I even, did I scratch these opening them up? No, I don't think I did. Yay me. Okay, let me get this other one. It's always nerve wracking to me opening plastic on cards. I'm always worried I'm gonna scratch the cards with the knife. So let me open up this first pile. Oh, you guys, they're a really nice mat. Okay, the first edition for comparison was glossy and the second edition here has a really, really nice um, smooth matte feel to it. I also believe these cards are smaller. So let's do a little recap. Now these were in two piles, but even though they were in two piles, there's a minuscule bit of a gap between the two decks, but it's almost barely noticeable. I love the black edging. I think the first um, edition was larger cards and edged in a, um, a gold gilding. What's this on the bottom here? Is this, oh, I see that's just a white bordered. Some of the cards will have like these little micro black borders. Some have micro white borders, depending on the artwork. So you can kind of see that there. Oh my gosh, okay, so let's take an up close. Oops, sorry, look at the backing here. So you can see there's really not a lot of reflect at all, which is gonna be really, really nice. And you have these, um, I believe these are moths. They may be butterflies, but I think they're moths with antlers. And then you still have that lemnus kit on the back. This is a black and white deck, but you can see that it's very, um, how do I describe? Very, very detailed very detailed artwork and a lot of shading so it's not this harsh black and white so like as an example a harsh black and white deck for me in a nice way like I like it is the um, Gorgon's Tarot it's like a pure black and white deck whereas this there's tons of grays almost like charcoal and I'm, I'm actually not familiar with the art medium and somebody's probably gonna smack me Goliath probably being first in line like why don't you know the medium I'm really bad with art you guys but I do know what I like, and this is very, very beautiful and detailed. So let's talk again. I'm sorry, I said I was gonna talk about the changes and I got all drawn into this. So um, some changes. The cardstock is a 300 GSM cardstock with a matte silk lamination. So this is the kind of matte lamination that is really nice because it doesn't tend to clump. It has a really smooth, almost silky feel to it. Um, it's the cardstock that I often refer to as like buttery cardstock. Um, so it feels really, really nice and very high quality, but it's, it's not that sort of scratchy matte. Um, yeah. The first edition was gilded. Now it is black matte edges. And I'm just wondering if there's anything else I should point out before we dive in. I think that's about it other than the changes to the boxes. Oh, the card size, that's right. So I do have, and I'm probably gonna do a side-by-side -side here just for comparison. This is a standard Rider Waite Smith. So if you had the first edition and you know the size, this is actually a really nice change to the size. So it's just a tiny bit taller than the Centennial Edition Rider Waite Smith. And it's noticeably wider, but I think, I don't know that I want these cards much smaller than this because the artwork is so, so detailed. So let's bring over the Rider Waite Smith and let's dive in to a detailed uh, walk through of these cards. And I may end up moving these if I find them too distracting. So we'll we'll start out with the Rider Waite and we'll see where we get. But I'm really excited. There was also, I believe, originally a um, a second set of words on the bottom of the card. So right now you have the uh, number, the fool, and then you also have a title. So this is the Eternal Vagabond. I believe this is what it says, yeah, the Eternal Vagabond. Um, whereas I believe in the original version of the card, you had multiple languages down here. So, or not languages, but fonts. So I think you had a second font. Anyways, the way it is now, it's easy to read um, and it doesn't feel like too much. So that's really good. Okay, now I'm gonna zoom this in. I know I'm a big tease. We're already almost 10 minutes in and I haven't even started looking at the cards yet. 
So I think, do we need to come in a little further? Let's come in a little bit further. There we go. Okay, so we have the Fool, the Eternal Vagabond, and we have this like, almost like musketeer style mouse. That's what I think of when I see this. I'm not sure why. It's a, it's a mouse like diving off a cliff and he has this like ribbon all around him. And it's almost as if it's like a bungee cord or a bungee rope, but, but it's ribbon, right? It's almost like he thinks he has some kind of a safety net, but he's not overly concerned. I really, really love that energy of just that, that free fall, that dive. I love that. Next we have our magician, and here it is called the magician, the alchemical master. And you definitely get this really um, deep magic kind of vibe from this artwork. You have the glowing eyes here in this wild cat. Um, I'm assuming this is a lion of some kind or a lioness. It's very, very interesting. I'm not entirely sure. And it's a dark, um, and, oh man, I can't wait to dive into the guidebook for this. I'm going to just look because I just, I can't help myself. I'll try to help myself throughout, but I just, I can't hear. Does it tell me what kind of creature this is? Um, does it tell me, does it tell me? I really want to know right now. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pour through the, the whole book here. But I really want to know. Okay, I'm not going to do this to myself because I will get so hung up. Okay, so regardless, um, I really like the power and the potency in this card. I really love that we still have the Lemnus get over here. You can see it. Let's make sure the camera can focus. You'll see it right over here. Um, and you have this idea of the elements also present. I really love this. Next we have the High Priestess, and oh, look at this. So you really get that a similar feel here. Yes, it's an animal. This is um, definitely some kind of cat, uh, hairless cat, maybe Egyptian style cat. Sorry, my chair is very squeaky. I need to like oil it or something. Um, so this one says the Crescent Moon Cat. And I love that you have this third eye with the crescent moon around it, and you have the um, onk here, and you get the black and the white pillars behind. So all of your really necessary symbology is definitely there, and you definitely get this, I'm going to say definitely a bunch, you get this air of mystery um, and the full moon in the back. All of what I need for a high priestess is definitely here. Oh man, I'm so excited to work with this deck. Okay, so next we have the empress, and this is really interesting because you get this feeling almost of death birthing life or life from death in a way, because you have this almost skeleton-like creature. And actually, now that I'm looking closer, it's not so much death necessarily, but almost like an x-ray view into the creature with the fledgling inside. And this is called the alchemical mother. So this one was called, there was another alchemical something here, hold on. Ah yes, the alchemical master was the magician, the crescent moon cat, and now we have the alchemical mother. Man, I love this so much. And you get this idea of being just like pregnant with possibility. I love the idea that you get this view into this little fledgling in here. I really enjoy that image. The Emperor. This is one of, I think, the, my favorite Emperor cards I think I've ever seen. There's something really potent about it, and yet it doesn't feel unapproachable. And I think it's partly because we're so close into the image. And I could definitely see this idea. You have this, almost this cloak that's on the Emperor. And one of the things about the Emperor to me is that he's very strong and he also maintains this sort of cloak of sovereignty, whereas we don't really get that in the Empress card um, in the standard Rider Waite Smith, but we definitely do with the Rider Waite Smith Emperor. We get this idea of power and of control and of, of dominance in a way. He's called the, the ruling father. Um, so you get this idea, but it, does, it feels a little bit less imposing to me, interestingly, than the Rider Waite Smith Emperor. The Hierophant, the Master of Keys. I adore this image. So for starters, it's really intense. You get all of these like eyes in this headpiece. And we don't even really know what we're looking at. There's an air of like unknown to this. And it's almost like this creature, its back is to us. In fact, I'm like 99% sure its back is to us. And then there's all of these keys. And you get this idea that you really have to go through this figure to get to those keys. That there's And, and in a way, the perspective on this is really interesting because it feels like he's leading us somewhere. Like he's asking us to follow him, which is an interesting perspective. We don't get that in the Rider Waite Smith where we're looking face on on the figure. Instead, we get the idea that we're being taken to a place. We're being taken somewhere. I also really love the detail of all the different spiritual paths that are represented by these keys. 
keys. Um, we have the Star of David here. We have a cross. We have a crescent moon. I'm not going to recognize all of these, um, but there is this idea of multiple faiths represented in the style of keys. We even here have um, what looks like some kind of a skull, like a, bird's, a bird of praise skull. So you get the idea of lots of different um, spiritual paths, lots of different faiths, and he's asking you to follow him. That's a really beautiful card. Probably, again, one of my favorite Hierophants. When I think of my relationship with this card, this one is... It gives me so much room to explore, and I really love that. The lovers. Okay, I love the whole flamingo lovers thing. This reminds me a, quite a bit, actually, um, and I believe this card came... I'm not sure, actually, but this reminds me of another card that has flamingos. I think it's the Baba Studios um, Alice Tarot has two flamingos forming a heart here. Uh, but I love that we have the actual bird's necks making the heart. We also have this sort of um, jewelry or adornment that sort of wraps around them both and you almost get this idea of, oh, and they're sharing the same heart, which is a really cool imagery. This one calls itself the alchemical heart, the alchemical heart, which I love. Master of Keys, Alchemical Heart. I love these little titles um, to go along. It gives you something else to sort of think about and consider in your readings. But this idea of sharing the same heart or sharing the same soul, this, oh, this card almost speaks more to the energy of, say, a soulmate or a divine connection with somebody. Um, and I really like that take on the card. Next, we have the Chariot. And this is a really great perspective because we have all of this sort of wildness in the environment. This calls itself the Chariot of Osiris. And we have this eye of the horse right up front and next to us with all of these beautiful beads in the mane. And you definitely get this feeling of, of the environment is wild and the need for focus and determination here. I really like that. I really like that. It's definitely different than what we normally encounter in the Chariot. Ah, and here we have a slightly different take, so let's just take a peek because we've, we've got the slightly different order. So here we have the Justice card, and this is really beautiful. The Doves of Equality. Ooh, what a potent concept for a Justice card. We have the scales there, and the scales seem to be held in the talons or the claws of these doves, and they're all working together, all of them holding the, oh, I forget what it's called, that they hold. Is it laurel? Oh, I'm not going to get that right. Um, but it's a, a symbol of peace. It's a symbol of peace. And so there's an idea of justice brings peace, which is really a beautiful concept and something that I've been doing a lot of thinking about. I'm just going to tuck that back in its normal spot for myself. Okay, so next we have the Hermit, the Inner Master, and we have this armadillo, and I freaking love... Oh, wait. Sorry. Let me move my strength card here because I messed up my order. There we go. Um, I know that these don't look like the Rider Waite Smith, but the Rider Waite Smith card is there just to remind me, you know, of what the classical image looks like and where maybe there might be some overlapping symbols. Here we definitely have the idea of turning inward, of being curled in on oneself. And this is an energy that is very neutral with the Hermit. It reminds me, oddly, it makes me think of the Deviant Moon Borderless Tarot and this Hermit that's sort of crawling into itself. And in the Deviant Moon deck, it's very shadowy in its representation of that energy. And here it feels very neutral, um, but you still get this like direct gaze from the Armadillo, and I love that. The Wheel of Fortune, the Great Wheel, and I love this with all the feathers. This is really beautiful. You also get these crystal outlines. I'm loving this artwork, and I'm not always a fan of black and white art, but this has so much depth to it. This is my, this, this image is everything to me. This is everything to me, because you really don't know, oh, sorry, that's tradesies again, so you can see. You really don't know who is the one standing up to who, right? And is it the snake facing the lion, or the lion facing off with the snake? And interestingly, I like this image symbolically as well, because when we think of lions, in, the, in this, let me, let me back up, see if I can make sense of this. In the Rider Waite Smith image, we, we see ourselves often as the figure here, and the lion is what we're facing down, that what we need the courage to face. And in my personal practice, strength is often about facing your own inner shadow, your own inner stuff. And I like the imagery here because I see myself in this situation as the lion and lions representing that sort of inner fire and inner passion, the drive we have to face our stuff. And then here's this cobra and a snake 
even though I love snakes as symbols of transformation, in this image we get the idea of the snake as the shadow, as what we're facing down, and I think that's really powerful imagery. It says the... Uh-oh. Oh, the lion and the cobra. That makes perfect sense. Oops. Okay, now we're back to... Oh, i got to put my strength back in order because I apparently can't deal. Oh, and I bought my camera in the process. Okay, now we're on to the hanged man. Uh-oh. Did I miss? Oh, I did miss. There we go. The hanged man, the suspended monkey. How great is that? Okay, this is everything. This monkey is, com th these two cards are probably the ones that have the most similarities to me, um, at least symbolically speaking. We still have our reversed creature here, but we have a monkey hanging from its tail. Um, interestingly, it seems to have almost like bird-like Oh, no, those are regular monkey, monkey paws, monkey hands. Um, it's holding a mala or an intention um, prayer beads in one paw, and it's got its arms crossed in front, not behind. And we see the ohm symbol inside of this lotus on its belly. And these things all speak to me to doing the work of really being mindful of the experience, being present. Um, mining the experience for what it's worth really speaks to me of patience and of finding your your calm center in the in the in the midst of chaos or in the midst of a position where you have to take a step back and you need to take that that moment to get clarity and to get patience oh my gosh you guys this is gonna be a really long walkthrough but I, I think we're okay with it we're just gonna roll with it death the metamorphic moth and this is obviously who we see on the back of the card. So the back of the cards essentially is death, which is really cool. I love that for tarot. Um, and here we get this almost like reverse negative, or that's what you'd call like a negative imagery. We have the sort of raven skull in the background here, and then we have this moth with antlers and all these beautiful decor hanging from it. And you get the idea of, of change and metamorphosis. Moths and butterflies are obviously beautiful um, representations of death because of that concept of transformation of one thing has to die in order for something else to be reborn. There's so much to work with here um, symbolically. Oh, I love temperance. I don't think I remembered this artwork from before. So it, it is the same, I'm quite sure, but I just didn't remember it. I love this so, so much. So anybody who knows me knows that the lotus is an important symbol to me, as is obviously the ohm symbol. Um, but the lotus is an important symbol to me, as is the yin-yang symbol. And I love when temperance cards feature the yin-yang symbol. Uh, the idea that you can't have the light without the dark or the dark without the light, and there must be a little of each in the opposite, right? So the dark has a, a little bit of light in it, and the light has a little bit of dark in it. They're wonderful symbols for balance and for harmony. The, the koi here just add to the image so beautifully. And the lotus, of course, is a really wonderful symbol for personal growth and for the beauty of balance because, of course, the lotus has to go through all of this mud and all of this depth in order to, to grow and to flourish. And often, the deeper the mud, the more beautiful the lotus. Um, and as Thich Nhat Hanh says, no mud, no lotus, right? You have to have that darkness to have the light. Uh, and I think that's just really beautiful. What does this call itself? The Pond of Balance. Oh, so pretty. The Devil. I have to admit, I've never been a huge fan of this image, but I will also admit that it does the job, right? It definitely gets the message across. What is the devil? You get this idea of sort of, he's got, almost like he's just eaten something and he's got blood dripping from his jaws. And there's the idea of definitely consequence of one's, um, indulgences or of one's uh, decisions, right? The tower, and this is called the burning tree. And this is again a very naturey but apt image. We have, oh, this is really emotional to look at actually. You have these birds who are in this tree that's a, that's alight with flame. And this front bird here, you almost feel, I almost feel like these lines next to its eyes. Let me bring this up. I'm, I'm sure you're watching this and able to see it better than I can on my viewfinder, but almost like those lines are tears. And you have these birds who are trying to protect their babies. And these little, these little baby birds aren't going to be able to easily be taken away from this place. Um, so you really get the idea of loss and of an undoing. And the potency is definitely here for this card. The star, the cosmic circle. That's really gorgeous. It's interesting. It reminds me of um, a quote or a saying, and I'm not going to get it quite right, but it's something like um, 
the cracks are where the light gets in. Um, something along those lines. Somebody may be able to quote it in the comments below. Um, but that's what this reminds me of. It reminds me of the places where we experience deep wounds and how those are the places where the light enters us. Um, that's what that makes me think of. Only we're, of course, looking at what looks to be a tree stump where it has these, these Mars or these, these deep grooves in it. The moon. This is just a beautiful moon card. I've got no issue. I, I am cool with a moon card that just features a moon because I'm so c comfortable with the symbology of the moon in the tarot. Um, this is the silver shadow reflect reflection or just reflects. I think it's the silver shadow reflect reflection, but I can't reflect. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The silver shadow reflector reflector. I might have to double check that one. That that font for the title is just a little bit hard on my eyes, um, but keep in mind that I am a little bit both far, both nearsighted and needing reading glasses at this stage, so that is probably me, but that is a little bit small to read. So the moon, that's really, really pretty. Let's see what our sun looks like. Oh, I love this with the baby bear. Well, childlike bear. I love that you still have, though, the ferocity of this um, sort of mama bear down here. To me, the sun is a representation of authenticity, of being um, who you are in an unabashed, um, unashamed kind of way. That's what the naked baby kind of represents to me on the classic Rider Waite Smith and in a lot of the Rider Waite Smith clones. And so here what's interesting is you have the innocence and the sometimes naivete of, of vulnerability and of being yourself in this small bear, but the ferocity and the protective energy of the big bear, of the mama bear. And I love that. Um, this says the beams of life. Oh, this judgment card is something, isn't it? This is one of the ones that's so memorable. If you've ever seen a walkthrough of this deck, if you're like me, this is one of those images that just really sticks with you. The transcendence, the transcendence. And we have this, sorry, I'm moving around on my chair and it's going to squeak. Bear with me. Okay, so we have this like idea of a polar bear that's been thrust into the sea from its, um, from its, what do you call those? Why am I blanking? From its um, iceberg. There we go. From its floating iceberg. And you get the feeling that this, this polar bear has lost its home and it's, it's angry and it's, it's struggling against this new life it's being called to. So there's uh, more of the struggle for me in this card, but it also definitely speaks to environmental Pro, like uh, issues of the day, right? And of the complications and the consequences of those issues. So it depends on how you want to read the card to me, how I might take it. I don't know if I read the title, but it's The Transcendence. The world, the sacred circle. I adore this image because you're seeing this very um, cohesive uh, environment of sea life all contained within one container. And what's interesting is you have all the different levels of creatures. You have the jellyfish, you have the smaller schooling fish and the larger schooling fish, but you also have this net that creates that container. And while you could definitely look at that net through a particular lens and catching the fish and all that kind of thing, you can also look at that net as creating the boundary because the world associated with the planet Saturn is also to me about boundaries, right? We have this circle that contains the freedom and the dancing that happens within. There's a wholeness to the world that we want to see. We want to see that sense of completion, but to me, in my reading, I also want to see that idea of a container, of something that, that holds and protects as well as allows us to have freedom within. So this represents that, I think, really beautifully. Well done. Really, really, really beautiful card. Okay, we're on a different suit, so let me switch the suit we're looking at here just to make to get us on the same page I'm just going to set my other one aside because I don't know what the order is going to be actually so we're just going to pull my other suits over here and again I apologize for my squeaky chair I'm going to ask Peggy if she can help me fix it um, so Ace of Cups, I love this. We don't really know fully what kind of creature is reaching for the Ace of Cups, but there's this overflowing, um, abundant cup, which is something I really like to see in my Ace of Cups. And of course, the Cups suit is my favorite suit uh, because I'm a water baby myself, so I really like to see that. Adore the Two of Cups, the intertwined snakes. And again, we have this idea of a beautiful harmony and a beautiful balance. Yes, there's also some interesting ferocity here with these two serpents, these two snakes intertwining. You have the dark and the light. You have that yin-yang kind of energy, which we want to see that balance and that duality in the twos. Oh, I forgot to flip that card. Um, and the shared cups. Like, all the, everything I need is here, um, but a quality is an, is an aspect of what I like to see in my twos, so I really like that. So that's perfect. The three of cups, the trinity triangle. 
this one's interesting and we have the alchemical symbol for the um oh my gosh the Philosopher's Stone, I believe, in the center, you get this idea that they complete one another, right? You get this idea that there is a there's something where each one of them has an important part to play in what they've created. And that's interesting because one of my favorite ways to look at the Three of Cups, especially lately, has been to see that each person in that circle brings a different quality to bring that sense of completion through and and create that sense of wholeness that maybe wouldn't be experienced with only one or two. Yeah, I knew this was going to be a long one, guys. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this. Remember, you can always double my speed by using the little gear icon at the bottom right and watching me on two speed. I will sound like a chipmunk. Good luck. Best wishes. But otherwise, you might want to grab a snack because we're going to be here for a while. So the three of cups, love, love, love. The four of cups, the wandering mind. Gosh, these are so well thought out. They're so well thought out. I don't even know where to start. Okay, so again, we have this imagery of, of he's like this, this lion, lioness, I guess it's a her. This lioness has got her head on this book and a scrying ball here. And there's this feeling of, of, of almost oversaturation of what she already has. And just missing that opportunity is one of the things about the Four of Cups. But what I, one of the primary ways I tend to look at the Four of Cups and I tend to read the Four of Cups is this idea of emotional stability and what does that look like and what does that feel like often emotional stability can feel almost boring and um, stagnating and sometimes that's true but sometimes it's a lack of appreciation a lack of an awareness of what we already have a lack of gratitude sometimes so that's a really interesting perspective and i think it's very beautifully illustrated here the five of cups the spilt regret what a cool title for this card. Gosh, I'm really, really loving. Sorry, I'm putting my cards in weird spots. Okay. The Spilt Regret. This is literally, I mean, the Five of Cups, what is it if not for the don't cry over spilled milk kind of card, right? It literally is showing three, three glasses spilled. What has been lost? What has been emptied? What emotional thing are we grieving? What loss are we grieving? But a reminder that there are still two remaining cups. We may have regrets. We may have grief. We may have loss, but that doesn't mean that we're fully emptied. So well done there. Okay, this Six of Cups literally is making me so super happy. Um, the first thing I thought when I flipped this card, as ridiculous as it probably sounds, is I thought of the Hungry Hungry Hippos game. Please somebody tell me you remember that and it's not, I think they still sell it, so somebody's gonna remember it, I'm sure. Um, love the lotuses here, love all the cups, but really I love the whimsy in this card and the, the comfort and the like happiness in these hippos and yeah, it just, that made me really happy. The reuniting water hole. Ah, oh, yes, like coming back to the water hole, revisiting that water hole. I love that. There's a, there's a return energy to that, and I really enjoy that. The Seven of Cups, the Tentacles of Illusion. How cool is this with all the different tentacles holding up all the different things? We have a witch's hat here, butterflies, a snake, bubbles, a plant. This one's got some kind of like air or smoky element to it, and this one looks like it's got fire or something like that in it. Um, there's a really cool selection of things here that you could really look at and go, okay, we need to get, we need to get grounded. We need to look at what, you know, what makes sense. I like this a lot. It's so funny how oftentimes I don't know what I'm going to think of imagery until I've got it in my hands and I'm thinking about it. And particularly when I'm thinking about it with what I know of and understand of the Rider Waite Smith, I really enjoy doing these kinds of comparisons and deep dives because I get so much out of the deck doing it this way. The Eight of Cups, the high door. Ooh, okay. Where do I even start? Okay, so first of all, there's some Hebrew letters here, which unfortunately I do not know, um, so I can't speak to those. What I really love here, though, is the idea that we're in a desert landscape. And we are here, too, which is actually interesting because I never thought of the color of the ground here and how it's also a bit of a deserted ground, desert type of terrain. And our figure is moving into literally greener land. And I've never noticed that detail until right now, which is so cool. This is one of the reasons I love going through multiple decks. But in any case, we have this desert and the sand and these cups are being left behind. And we have this black cat who is literally ascending to a door high up in the heavens. And you get this literal idea of ascension. You get this literal idea of the reason you're leaving what you're leaving is because what you're leaving is already 
d fulfilled its its role. It's already you've already gotten anything you can from it, and it's 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 long past. Oftentimes in an Eight of Cups moment, we're long past the time when it makes sense to move on, and often we are moving on to something better for us. Ultimately, we are making a choice in an Eight of Cups moment. At least in my personal experience, we're often making a choice for our own higher good. We're moving ahead and we're moving on in order to move up in our own personal evolution. And this illustrates that so well. Okay, we're just going to have to call this an unboxing first impressions deep dive walkthrough because holy moly, am I having a lot to say about these. The Nine of Cups, the Contented Pelican. Okay, I freaking love this. Not only is this pelican's mouth or beak or whatever you call this part of its body completely full of fish, but there's actually cups in there too. It's like over full. It's like so full. It has everything it possibly could need. There's a real idea here of emotional abundance and emotional prosperity and fulfillment, which is what I look for in my Nine of Cups. As some of you know, the Nine of Cups is a bit of a deal breaker card for me. It has to make sense to me or it can ruin my experience with a deck. And it's nobody's fault. It's just that I'm so terribly picky. And to be honest, I'm not overly fond of the original Nine of Cups artwork. Um, so I usually look to my other decks to step up the game. And this one does that really, really well. The Ten of Cups, the joyous sky. And these orcas are literally playing and diving in and out of the clouds. And you get this like really bountiful, joyful energy here, which is of course what we want for our Ten of Cups. I love, love, love. Oh, quartz. I hadn't even really thought about the quartz. Okay. So it looks like we're going king. I'm going to, I'm going to just change this up because I can't help myself. Let's look at the page first because I just really want to. Okay. So our page of cups, the sister of roses, and we have this like Bambi like doe or deer, but also with antlers. This feels like it's meant to be like a young female because it's got the spots. I'm not sure how that goes, but it's also got the antlers. The potential for antlers is almost what I'm getting from this intuitively is this potential for antlers coming within this, within this doe. And I also get this feeling of softness and an openness and vulnerability, which is definitely working for me when it comes to the Page of Cups. Oh my gosh, really, really happy with this deck. Okay, the Knight of Cups. Oh, did I read the name of this one? The Sister of Roses? Yes, I did. Yes. The Brother of the Wild, the Knight of Cups here. And I love this because he's howling. And in the sky, in this like amorphous sort of background, you see these other shapes of wolves that are running. And you definitely get this idea of the quest or the call because these the smoke of these other wolves is coming out of its mouth. And the thing about the Knight of Cups is that he's definitely the one who, who really is questing for something fulfilling, right? He's looking for that thing to, to fulfill his dreams. Love that. The Queen of Cups, the Mother of Crystals. I love this like mama bear kind of energy looking up into the sky with hope and and openness. I, I love this so much. I'm getting so drawn into this deck and I get it now. It's it's kind of funny because I, I was really excited about the second edition because again, some of my issues with the first edition were card size and the gloss and all that kind of thing. And this just feels so approachable. Okay, sorry, King of Cups, the Chief Eagle. Yes, somebody wise and like with that with that knowledge, the three of or sorry, the three, the third eye there in the center. Love, 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 love. Okay. What suit do we have next? We have pentacles. Let me grab those. Love this. We have um, almost like a bird of prey offering the pentacle or the coin to us. Love it. And I like how the um, the aces don't have this border on the bottom. Instead, the title of the card is like built into the artwork. I think that's a really cool way to distinguish the aces as special because they are special. Okay. The two of pentacles, the juggling snake. This is a really classical image to me, coiling around the two things, the two responsibilities. I don't actually need a lot of... Um, scene happening in a two of pentacles because I know this card so well and the dominant symbol has always been to me this um, lemnus kit with the two pentacles in it so this totally works for me I don't have any complaints the three of pentacles the three wise masters Ooh, interesting because in this card we have three figures all working together to accomplish a goal but here we have a smaller figure in the front i don't know if you can see it it's almost got a classic hierophanty kind of energy there's this smaller figure here some kind of animal creature and it's visiting these three wise creatures and i am so bad with animals but there's a horse a bull and i know what this is i just can't remember its name i know oh is it a gazelle i know it i know it runs 
Is it a gazelle? It's probably something else. I'm not great with animal lore, guys. I'm sorry. Um, but you get this idea that there's like almost a council of elders and there's this sort of um, energy that that you would visit or you would you would seek to learn. There's definitely a learning or a study energy to this card, which is definitely, I think, a part of the Three of Pentacles classically as well. But I think it's just illustrated more clearly here. The Four of Pentacles... The prudent mountain goat. I love this. It's it's that caution. It's got four pentacles, one under each of its hooves. It's very hard to see. It's it's small, but it's definitely there. And it's managed to protect itself up on its little mountain up there where nobody can get its pentacles, but it also can't have any other experiences. So you definitely get both sides of the four in this card. The five of pentacles, hardship, mountain. Oh, this is tough with these horses clearly undernourished. This is so sad. And you've got these animals just almost waiting to kind of take advantage. Um, yet you also almost get this idea that that there's there's a potential for help, right? You get this light. I'd be interested to hear what the guidebook has to say about this. But you have this light from above, just like you do here. And then you have this hardship featured. So the landscape of the card, even though it's completely different, ha is really the same, right? You have this light from above, you have this um, opportunity for help, and then you have all of this suffering that's perhaps unnecessary going on here. What was that called? Oh yeah, Hardship Mountain. The Six of Pentacles, the Sacred White Sewell Bill? Sewell Bowl? Sorry. The Sacred White Scale Bowl. Oh my gosh, that's me and my eyeballs. So we have a rebalancing happening here, a reharmonizing in the Six of Pentacles. We get the scale. This is where the help comes from, right? The Seven of Pentacles, the rewarded frog. You get this idea of patience, patience, patience among all of these Venus flytraps. And if he just sits there long enough, he'll get his chance to get one. It's really interesting. It's also a bit of um, um, energy here of of resourcefulness, right? Oh, okay, not a fan of spiders. So that one's a little difficult for me to see right away. Totally forgot about this card. The Eight of Pentacles, the Patient Weaver. Well, we know, I, I, I don't have any problem with um, spiders as a representation of the Eight of Pentacles. I think it makes a lot of sense, especially because of the amount of effort and work and mastership that goes into creating their perfect web. That's still hard for me because I'm really a little bit arachnophobic. Um, interestingly, though, this creature has nine legs, not, or excuse me, ten legs, not eight legs. So I can tell myself it's not a spider, but I mean, it's, it's a spider. Let's be honest. Not my favorite, but uh, it might help me do some work around spiders. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, yay, lotuses. I feel better now. Okay, nine of pentacles, the tranquil spotted doe. And this reminds me actually quite a bit of the doe in our page of pentacles. But now we see one who has sort of been through, I don't know why I'm digging for it. This video is already going to be a million hours long, but um, this is beautiful. And you get this idea of luxury and of having everything you need at hand. That definitely works. I absolutely adore this Ten of Pentacles, and I'm not even sure I can tell you why, but this is another one of those memorable images. I love that the Kabbalah Tree of Life is so visible and obvious here, whereas it's it's definitely also obvious on this card once you know it's there, but until you know it's there, it's just, it's one of those like Easter egg kind of things that I didn't know about tarot until much later into my tarot journey. Here, it's like right here, and it's super obvious. Um, the title of this card is The Oyster of Metatron. Oh, that's cool. Um, we know that oysters represent the pearl. They, they have that sort of hidden treasure. Um, so there's a lot there to unpack, but I really like that. And I think it brings the highlight into the, the, the real gold is in this, or the real treasure or the real legacy, I guess, is in the work that we do through the Tree of Life, which is a whole thing you can go down as far as tarot study goes. Oh yeah, right. King. I really want to look at these in the order that I'm used to because I just want to. Okay. Page of Pentacles, the Butterfly Snow Vixen. This is really interesting. I don't know that I have a lot of opinions on this just yet. For me, the Page of Pentacles is somebody very steadfast and resourceful, somebody who uh, isn't afraid to workshop a problem and take their time to sort things out. I'll be interested to read more about this card in the guidebook, but I don't have a lot of immediate like, hmm, how is that Page of Pentacles coming to mind? The Knight of Pentacles, the Aztec Hawk Warrior. 
Oh, I love this. This is a very, for some reason, this does feel very earthy to me. Um, and, oh, wait, 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 wait. What happened? What happened, Lisa? We were comparing the page to the night. Where's my page? Oh, my pentacles and my Rider Waite Smith Rider Border. Okay, this makes more sense. I was talking about the knight being resourceful. Okay, so let's go back here. <laughs> so here we have the Page of Pentacles holding and looking at the coin, sort of examining it. There's a bit of study to the Page of Pentacles. Now we're on track. There's a bit of study to me and examination to the quality of the Page of Pentacles. And actually, now that I'm comparing to the correct card, this butterfly reminds me a little bit of looking past the Veil of Illusion. Our earthly suit um, courts are very practical. They tend to not get swept up as much in the filters of perspective. Uh, uh, What's the word I'm looking for here? Projections and um, things that the other suit courts might. So this idea of clear seeing and maybe looking past the filters is what I get from this, which is interesting. This makes more sense. Okay, so we have an earthy knight. We have the knight of pentacles. Um, this is, again, the Aztec hawk warrior. Um, this feels like the wise kind of warrior. I mean, all of the knights are, have a willing to go to battle kind of energy about them. But there's an there's the I still get the feeling here that this figure this creature has that uh, caution or wisdom behind what they do. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, and then we have the Queen of Pentacles, the Indian Henna Mother. Oh, that's interesting. I uh, like me some henna. But I love how bountiful this particular queen is. We have all these like white moths or butterflies around her, and she seems like very bountiful like a large bodied wild cat of some kind you definitely get this feeling of um again like sort of looking directly at you really seeing you the really earthy people i've known have a tendency to just really give it to you straight right they don't fuss around with a lot of the other stuff but they might be they tend to be very direct um in a loving kind of they do it from a place of wanting to help care for you or help you care for yourself um but they're very yeah, they're very forthright. Maybe that's a good word. Um, yeah. All right. Let's take a look at the king. And here we have like a tiger, the father of roses. I love this with the crystals up here. Very, again, abundant sort of masterful energy. Interesting that the pentacle here is upside down. I'm really curious. I cannot wait to dive into the guidebook for this, honestly. Okay, next we're into the wands. So let's pull my wand suit out here. Put my other cards out of the way. So here we have like an octopus holding this wand, but we still have the growth on the wand. That's one of the kind of like, I guess I would call it Easter eggs in the wand suit is that the ace of wands is, or any of the wands that feature growth on them are like a disembodied stick. They theoretically shouldn't have anything growing on them and yet they do. There's a sort of wonder and magic to the ace of wands. Ooh, I love this charge and potential with this two of wands. It says the lightning strike and or the lightning struck antenna. Okay, that's really cool. Oh my gosh, you guys, this is gonna be the longest walkthrough ever. I'm sorry, there's just so much here. The lightning struck antenna. To me, one of the keywords of the two of wands is potential. And so there's this idea of potential, like something's been electrified, it's been charged. So what's gonna happen with it next? I love that. The Three of Wands, the Creative Bone Prism. Oof. I love shapes like this for threes because they tell you how in the two we have something that's got, um, it's starting to come together but there's no structure yet and this definitely has the structure. We also see a Metatron's Cube Sacred Geometry in this artwork as well and I'm not as familiar with that symbol as I wish I was. Dustin's going to have words for me, I'm quite sure. All right, next we have the Four of Wands, the Beaming Vessel. Okay, I just love this image. I love the light coming out all four corners of this beautiful turtle. I love the idea of the turtle and the idea of um, that sort of completion or that mini completion. I don't know why, what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> I don't know if I'm even making sense. This deck is doing things to me. But there's definitely something here to be said about having all you need. The fours are definitely a moment to recognize that there's a wholeness or a, com a mini completion. It's like a first stage of completion. And I see that here. I, I don't know if I can tell you how, but, but I see it here. The Five of Wands, the Jaggered Union. Interesting. This one I want to read about. Um, I don't know enough about what this is supposed to represent. Typically in fives, we have conflict and competition. 
and that's sort of like who's gonna be the the ultimate winner so to speak I don't know if I see that in this image so I'll be interested to see more from the guidebook on that one the six of wands the El Goliath hive love it so there's definitely it's interesting for me to see bees in the six of wands I'm so used to seeing bees in like an eight of pentacles kind of place but you actually see that the hive or the comb is right here in the center and surrounding that is all of the bees and yet here comes this one here I'm wondering if this is supposed to be our victor he's it's a bee that's coming into the hive and has like a little um, a little branch with a flower it looks like it maybe even is holding it and so, oh these all these bees have little flowers that they're bringing in so that's really interesting it's like what are you bringing back what are you celebrating what is the um, what is the actual takeaway from that experience of success? The Seven of Wands, the Determined Otter. I love this. You get this idea of definitely building a dam, or maybe he's trying to break away a dam. Interesting. Again, this is one that I want to read more about. I love river otters. They're one of my favorite creatures. Oh, I love the shooting stars. What does it say? The meteor shower for the Eight of Wands. This is great. No complaints. Love it. The Nine of Wands, The Darkness Before Dawn. Man, is that an appropriate title for this card or what? Love, 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 love. The Ten of Wands, The Overburdened Beetle. Dang straight. Man, that Ten of Wands is, if it's not having taken on too much or ended up with more, way more than you bargained for, I don't know what is. Okay, let's put these back in order. I can't. I can't do it. So our page of wands, the moonscaped messenger. Ooh. Some of these, I feel like, I don't know if this is a deck that I'm going to be able to work with in large, large spreads, at least not until I take some time to get to know it better. I just feel like there's so much rich. I mean, I can't even do a freaking walkthrough in less than an hour, it looks like. So yeah, I've still got a whole nother suit. Okay, so knight of wands, the kind-hearted moose. Oh, interesting. I'd almost see this character as more of a knight of pentacles to me. Somebody a little slower moving, a little more methodical. Um, interesting about this. Mind you, there's also some flamboyance energy here. I can't wait to read more about this. Okay, Queen of Wands, the Cosmic Huntress. She's freaking stunning. I think she's a perfect Queen of Wands. I love that. And the King of Wands, the Glowing White Stag. I think that's also perfect for the wand suit. So that leaves us with the Swords suit. Let's take a look. Ace of Swords. Interesting that the sword seems less um, firmly held here. It's a little bit more precarious. You get the idea that the idea or the insight, if you don't do the work right away, it's going to slip from your grasp. There's definitely less of, a, less of a hold is the best way I know how to express that. Interesting because I've never thought of that before. Okay, that's trippy with the candles coming out the eyes of the otter. I don't know what I feel about that. Let's see. The blind seal. It definitely speaks to the idea of illumination versus sight um, and looking within. I don't love the way it's depicted, but I get it. I definitely get it. You still have the crescent moon. You still have the water. So all the symbology, the, the, the swords or the blades crossed in front of the heart, everything's there. I just don't love that particular way of expressing it, but I'm sure there's some meaning there. We can dive into the book and see. The Three of Swords, The Bleeding Raw Heart. This reminds me of that um, rose in the in the vessel for the um, the rose in the container for the Beauty and the Beast. That's what that makes me think of at first glance. You get this idea of a heart that's very very guarded. Look at all these spikes going around, and you can tell that it's guarded because it's been so wounded, which is a really um, clear way to look at this particular card. It's often very true. Oh, the bunny and the four of swords, the sacred space. That's a beautiful title for that card. That is everything I need. I'm trying to speed it up here, guys. The five of, five of Swords, the white scorpion versus the black scorpion. Um, really an idea of bullying here in this energy, doesn't it feel like? Yeah. The Six of Swords, the brand new journey. Oh, I love that. And taking the eggs away from all the danger. Yes, 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 yes. But interesting, I just noticed, taking the eggs away from all the danger, but there's still danger ahead. There's, it's not necessarily, yes, there's clear, clear, uh, calmer waters ahead, but there's also potential for more danger if you're not careful, right? There's still a lot of caution needed. And sometimes we don't see that extra caution needed in this card, so I love that. Oh, no! 
the Seven of Swords, the Thief in the Night. This reminds me of a story I used to read over and over again when I was a kid, and I think it was called Ricky Ticky Tabby. And it was about, I think I want to say like a weasel and, uh, was the good guy and the snake was the bad guy or something like that. I can't entirely remember, but that's literally the first thing I thought of when I pulled this out. Um, the snake is obviously stealing these eggs. Literally reminds me of that story. I have to look up that story now and remind myself, because that might be a very good Seven of Swords story. We don't know. Um, the Eight of Swords, the Imprisoned Bear. Oh. Definitely a feeling of being trapped, and this time under the ice. Look at the pause here. This is such a difficult card, but it speaks to that idea of feeling really, like, hemmed in and no place to go. The Anxiety card. Oh, look at this. The Nine of Swords, the Overwhelmed sea turtle look at it the waves are coming up and going to crash down on it. it's just overwhelming fear all of it above the symbology here is just spot on the ten of swords the barren desert and here we have a tree that's actually been stabbed with all of these swords and this idea of like complete ruin which is very thothy really when when i think of it that way i mean it's right away smithy too but the word ruin makes me think of thoth okay so king queen knight page. I don't know why I can't deal, guys, but I can't. Oh, that's right. There's extra cards. That's why it still seems like such a big pile. Okay. Page of Swords. The Sword Bearing Sister. Yes. Totally works for a page. Knight of Swords. The Hooded Brother. Look at all of these creatures here up against it. Again, with the weasel. They've got to be like little... Are these like... What are these? These are like little... Um, oh, what are the things that pop up? Oh, man. I'm so bad with animals. But they're all in the background facing off against this big snake who looks like he's about to just take them all down. Queen of Swords. I'm sorry, does that say the Baroque Queen? The Baroque Queen. Okay, I'm not sure. I don't even know for sure what the word Baroque means. And I'm not going to ask my virtual assistant because then I'll get all your guys' going. Oh, you guys, we're almost at over an hour. What am I going to do? Okay, King of Swords, the Father of the Night with his mouse. Yes, very strategic. He's on it. Okay, let's take a look at our extra cards. The Caution, the Heedful Mouse. Oof. The Ojibwa Catcher, the Shadow Dream Catcher. Ooh, interesting. The Expansion, the Shedding Snake. I love this as a, as a representation of like transformation and growth. The Sacred Heart, the Heart and Soul of Goliath. I almost get this like um, uh, Iron Throne sort of feeling from Game of Thrones like in the background here, which is really interesting. There's like a hardness and a softness to this card. The Karmic Release, the Sacred Karmic Deer. And this is from, this is the same image we see on the um, lid of the box and duplicated here. Is this? Nature, the Seed of Life. Oh, this pine cone is beautiful. The sacred fire, the rebirthing bonfire. Wowza. It's like a bone fire. This reminds me of the um, of the May bonfires um, talked about in the bonfire tarot, actually. The karmic soul tribe, the family. This is such an important card to me because it speaks to um, chosen family, soul tribe, as opposed to necessarily blood family. It's a very important card for me personally. The whole, the hidden inner strength, the shadow cat. Look at this howling sort of wolfy catty creature in the background. There's just so much more like potential there. Masks, the hidden wolf. Oh man, is that a good card? It's literally like a wolf in sheep's clothing. The shadow self, the dark inner swamp. Oof. This one does not have a title. I'm going to leave that aside for now. The Shaman, the Medicine Healer. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm going to go over an hour. I can't believe it. The Star Seed, the Demiurge. There's so much to dive into. I love this. The Sage, the Purity. And then we have a Yes and a No card, which I love. Now, I'm going to shuffle all of these together because I'm a heathen like that. Um, so let me get us zoomed out. I'm going to put my Rider Waite Smith away and we're going to have to probably start a new segment here because I can't do this in less than an hour. And we're back. Okay. So let's take a moment to shuffle this because that's what I'm trying to do. It is a pretty beefy deck, but that matte cardstock and it's a 300 GSM. I don't know if I mentioned that. Oh, it shuffles like a dream. You guys look at that mix. Oh, I love it. 
and unlike a rose petal finish, which as much as I am a sucker for a rose petal finish, you guys, rose petal finish does tend to like kind of cling and clump a little bit. Oh, it bridges beautifully. Okay, I love that. I love that. I love that. Okay. I'm going to cut it so that we can pull a card in a moment, but let's take a look at the book. Um, I may need to zoom us in again, so let's see if I can get it zoomed in a bit. There we go. So the El Goliath deck, tarot deck, a shadow tarot manifesto. So here we have vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, change, and growth. There are worlds within worlds. You just have to look a little harder, open your heart, and be brave. I love that. So the integration of my shadow story, what is shadow work? I'm really excited about that. This is all about introduction and creation, creating the deck. I really like actually getting a peek into the creator's thinking. Um, I think that's going to be really enjoyable to go through. Understanding the cards, shuffling the cards and getting into it. Um, there's also a description here of the wands, pentacles, swords and cups. It says explained. And then there's some spreads here. And then we get right into the card descriptions, and it looks like that takes us all the way through to the end. And it looks like, even in the extra cards, we don't, um, there's no skimping here, right? We still get the same amount of information on the uh, bonus cards. So let's see what card's on the top of the deck here, and take a look at the guidebook. And we have Queen of Swords, the Baroque Queen. So let's take a look. Oh, it's weird for me to do the book this way, I have to say. Um, but I wouldn't want to sacrifice the art, so there's that. Let's find our swords. Did we start with swords? I can't remember now. Pentacles. Okay, I have to turn the book this way to flip. Wands. Oh, swords. There we go. Oh, swords was the last suit. I just couldn't remember myself. Okay, so let's take a look. The Baroque Queen. Keywords. Sharp mind. Stern. Preferring to be alone. Strong-willed. Truth. Justice. Intellectual self-reflection. Discernment. Faces things absolutely head-on, if, even if hard to accept. Plays firmly by the set rules and guidelines of things. Can't stand lies and manipulative behavior. Prefers everything out on the table where she can see it. Straightforward and straight to the point. Dense personality. Has very realistic expectations of things, direct in all affairs and dealings, connected to the law and its enforcement, able to understand what is going on in a situation quickly and efficiently, a dark sense of humor. And then there's more text on the card and at the bottom there's reversed keywords, overbearing and too judgmental of others, cutting others to the quick, dismissive, harsh mindset that needs to relax, spending far too much time with others and not enough time alone with oneself to reflect and do the inner work that needs to occur. Love that. The Queen of Swords, much like the King of Swords, is a very strong forward thinker but prefers to be more alone in her home life and privacy is paramount to her. She opts more towards the quiet, simple life and often when I see this card it will indicate that this older female energy is now entering a phase in her life where she no longer wants to be in a fast-paced, chaotic life. This is a strong and powerful woman that certainly does not seek nor need the appreciation or adulation of others. She would rather reach inwards to her own memories and life to reflect and learn and better process her own life. This is a harder woman who would really prefer the company of herself and her animals rather than others. She likes to know about the who, what, when, where, and how of every situation. And sometimes others around her may feel interrogated or even bulldozed, but that's just how she is. She may have a very strong sense of liberality and justice. She's very selective of who she allows into her life, particularly with regard to friends and family. She has an approach to others in life that is very much in the mindset of take me as I am and accept all of me or have nothing at all and leave me and I'll be happy. She's able to look beyond pettiness and silliness, but is firmly fixated on truth and honesty. In this card, we see a female falcon in the dark. Her energy is sharp and bold. She wears an elaborate Baroque headpiece that attaches to the front of her beak with metal hanging chains. She possesses a sharp nature in this deck and is very much a queen in her own life, only ever accepting the absolute best. She's stern and does not show much feeling. The Queen of Swords knows that without any mastery of self, she masters nothing in her external world. The Falcon can soar high and assess the situation from afar before making any decisions. This woman may have worked as a teacher or a judge. Wow, that's a lot of information, but that is really, really cool. I will say that I tend to read the courts in much less of a gendered way, but I think that the way that that's expressed makes perfect sense. And we can look at it in the book as a gender and then obviously replace with the gender of the situation or the client. I really just want to shuffle these again. Yes, beautiful. They're probably not going to fan. Silk Mount Lamination. Oh, they fan pretty well. We only got a little bit of that clumping going on. Oh, and I still have this extra card, which I will have to look up at some point. So that, my friends, is the El Goliath Tarot. I'm going to actually 
I want to read families. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I know that this was a very, very long walkthrough, but I really wanted to do this deck justice. There's so much to it, and I hadn't really had a chance to really take it in before. I didn't end up really spending time with any detailed walkthroughs that other people had done, although there are some fabulous ones out there of the first edition if you'd like to see those and then do a bit of a comparison for yourself. Uh, if I think of it, I will link Kelly at the Truth and Stories walkthrough of the first edition because I know she did an amazing job, and then you can maybe do a little comparison and see what you think. But this is available now and as far as I understand is shipping now so I believe that announcement was only made in the last couple of days so you should be able to get a hold of this deck I believe that um, it is available if I'm not mistaken it will be available through Amazon as it was last time let's just see if there's any notes on this um, yes so it is available on Amazon USA or you can go to lgoliathtarotdeck.com and Goliath does take PayPal on the website. So thank you again so, so much to Goliath for letting me get an early peek at this deck. I'm so grateful and I'm so excited that I ended up spending this much time on it. Although hopefully y'all stayed with me through the journey. Thank you so, so much. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. And if you would like to book a tarot reading with me, you can do that over at supportiftarot.com. Thanks guys. Bye.